Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Solventless Extraction Explained, Profiting from Rosin. My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm the digital editor of Cannabis Business Times. In this exclusive webinar, Pure Pressure's Director of Marketing, Eric Vlosky, will give you the tools, strategies, and key information on how to capitalize on the quickly growing solventless extraction segment of the cannabis market. Focused on actionable insights, this webinar will cover solventless concentrates across every aspect. Eric will explain exactly what solventless concentrates are, which SKUs are the most popular, how to cultivate or source material that yields well for rosins, and how to attract customers to your brand. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping notes before we begin. You'll notice on your screen a questions box. Please do feel free to type in your questions as the presentation is going on, and I will relay them to Eric at the end. And also know that if you have to leave any time, we will be recording this presentation, uh, both the audio and video, and emailing the full archived link to all registrants in a few days here, so you will have access to, to the whole presentation. Uh, with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's presenter, Eric Vlasky. Thank you, Eric. Uh, appreciate the time and the intro, and I also appreciate everyone who's tuned in right now. This presentation was designed with you guys in mind, and it's going to be really focused on educating everyone about what Solventless is and how you can incorporate it into your business profitably. So to get started, just going to do a quick intro here and go over what our agenda is so everyone gets an idea of what the cadence. Uh, just like Eric just said, my name also Eric. Um, I'm the Director of Marketing and now Business Development with Peer Pressure. I joined in 2016, and I'm also the marketing and brand strategist for Pure Candle Labs, which is our sister consulting agency. I've been working in the cannabis industry uh, for just about years now. Uh, big passion for what's going on. It's awesome to see the growth in the industry. So today's agenda, first, I'm going to be talking about what is solventless. We're going to be going through kind of the layman's overview of solventless concentrates and all concentrates uh, just as they fit into the market in general. So the point of this is we're going to be talking both to total beginners, intermediate, as well as people who have quite a bit of experience here. So I believe that anyone who's tuning in, no matter how much knowledge you have about concentrates or cannabis in general, uh, you'll be able to take some great insights away from this presentation. Then we're going to start talking about solventless SKUs and some of the products that can be made solventlessly, as well as market data that supports where the market fit is, what kinds of products these are, uh, as well as giving you guys some ideas about who are purchasing these products, although some of that information is a little bit more anecdotal. Uh, then we're gonna be talking about material identification. This is one of the biggest topics in solventless. You know, how do I get the right starting material to yield well, to work well, to make those super high-end concentrates. Then I'm gonna wrap it all up with you know, really the top key tips and ways to frame your thinking about how to be successful with solventless, uh, you know, high-level points that you can take and implement immediately. And then we're gonna leave about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for uh, Q&A so that I can make sure that I can get through as many of your guys' questions as possible. So with that being said, the focus of this webinar is going to be on the THC side of cannabis and solvent lists. I will be touching on CBD as well, but just so everyone knows going into it, CBD is going to be a little bit more of a footnote for this presentation. Um, so let's get started. So what is solvent list? There's a lot of terms out there, but a solvent list cannabis concentrate is one that is made without any solvents such as butane, CO2, or ethanol. This extraction method is also known as mechanical separation. Now, there's no governing body dictating which words people are using in the cannabis industry now. It's still a bit of a Wild West situation, and we're hoping that in the near future, there will be a little bit more clarity around this. But some people say that water, for example, is a solvent. I would argue that it's not. Water in the solventless process for bubble hash or ice water hash, which we'll get to soon, uh, you're separating the trichomes from the plant material and trying to keep them intact. Whereas if you're performing a uh, light hydrocarbon, a CO2, or other solvent-based methods, it's actually a process of dissolution. So that's an important distinction here, that solventless 
for the most part is getting a mechanical separation and then rosin, which we're going to get into in a lot of detail here shortly, is expressing and filtering those isolated trichome heads. So solventless fits into the market as the craft beer of the concentrate world. It is the high-end artisan level concentrate that's a huge brand builder for any business that's processing or manufacturing cannabis products. You want to think about this as the same kind of consumer that's interested in organic fruits and foods. That's also going to be the type of person that's interested in solventless because well, to give it full credit with butane, CO2, and other methods, you can purge the vast majority of those residual solvents. You really can almost, it's very rare to get to actual 0% solvents. Or having a product that has never touched them in the first place, the only way you can do that is with solvent lists. Now, another question that we get a lot is, what does solvent-free mean versus solvent lists? Solvent-free means that it doesn't contain any solvents when it reaches the customer, but that it did contain solvents or solvents were used in the production of it. So there's a whole subset of customers that will only buy solventless products. And if you are not making a solventless product of one variety, whether it's a dabbable concentrate, uh, an edible or a topical, uh, you're, you're not even in their consideration set. So that's why it's important to recognize that having a solventless concentrate is an important part of any processing or manufacturing business plan. So to move on to the next section, some people who have been in the industry a long time are going to know all of this already, but for everyone who's tuning in, who's a little bit new to the concentrate world, uh, or is really just getting their feet under them about what kinds of concentrates are out there, I figured that it would be helpful to throw in this uh, fairly busy chart about where current concentrates in the cannabis industry fall. So on the left side of the chart here, you can see what we've got are the solventless end of concentrates, uh, dry sift, sometimes also known as keef, bubble hash, also known as ice water hash, and rosin. And those three products, of course, are going to be uh, what the vast majority of our focus is spent on today. But it's also important to know what the solvent-based concentrates are and to clear up something about distillate. So that distillate can actually be made with solvents or without. Um, you can do terpene separations with steam that wouldn't constitute as using a solvent. And then you can also see at the bottom here, uh, all of the different textures and types of oils that these various extraction methods can make. Now, this is the current state of these extraction methods. But what everyone should keep in mind is that things are evolving very rapidly across the space. Innovation is happening as quickly as anyone can keep up with uh, for solventless and solvent-based. So one thing that's not in this graph that people might be wondering is, what about flower rosin? That's a product I've heard about, I've tried, I've seen it. Um, that is not a separate process necessarily, we just lump that into the general category of rosin. So one thing that might stand out to people that aren't as familiar with the rosin process or maybe even familiar with the hydrocarbon process is that there's a significant amount of textures and different products, which we'll get into a lot of detail on uh, with making rosin. You know, a lot of people coming into this think, well, you know, I. I would like to make a dabbable concentrate product. It has a high price per gram, I've heard. You know, there's a lot of brands out there that have really made a name for themselves with this. But what can I really do with rosin? And the answer is, with minimal post-processing, you can come out with uh, an enormous variety of different oil textures and resulting products. So live rosin coming from fresh frozen material, straight separated terpenes, which can be used for all kinds of things. Uh, very popular product category right now, diamonds, uh, also known as diamonds and sauce. Sauce meaning separated terpenes, kind of the street word or the colloquial sense of that. Um, you can even make shatter, wax, butter, sugar, oil. There, there's all kinds of different textures that can be made. Now, there is some variability in your starting material, so that's why we've got dry sift and bubble hash there on the left, and that you typically have the most versatility 
with all of the different kinds of rosins that you can make when you are starting with bubble hash. And bubble hash really consists of just pure isolated trichome heads. And the same goes for dry sift. Again, really going back just briefly to what mechanical separation means, we're trying to isolate trichome heads, get rid of the plant debris and plant material so that we're capturing the pure essence of the plant, the resin, which is contained in those trichomes. And then that gives you a lot of a lot more flexibility to create all kinds of other products. Now, you'll see one product on here that hydrocarbon can make that rosin can't is crumble, which is a popular texture. But for the most part, rosin is capable of creating just about every texture of oil under the sun, uh, both in high-end dabbable concentrate form, as well as food grade form for topicals, edibles, and all kinds of things. And then while CO2 and ethanol are both extremely popular concentrate and processing methods, uh, the actual end resulting products are a little bit more limited. Now, those can be used in all kinds of things as well. But the whole point here is to just give everyone a sense of how much variety and how many different textures can be made. And that textures are not confined to one processing method or another in virtually all cases. So. Moving along, this is going to be for a full disclaimer, the only time in this entire presentation that you're gonna see anything about the products that we sell or what we do. Pure Pressure is an equipment manufacturer in the solventless space, and this is an overview of the general equipment that's needed to make these kinds of products. So uh, not doing sales, we're not doing plugs, but just wanted to give everyone that disclaimer while I explain the slide. This is about the only time you're going to encounter this. So for dry sift, how it's made is with a sifting machine. Uh, I've got an example here of the Green Bros Alchemist 420. That's got stainless steel screens that trim or flour is put in. It's graded against those screens, which shears the trichome heads off, which are then collected and can be used for a variety of different purposes, just like we were talking about all kinds of different oils and like we'll get into uh, different SKUs and products themselves. Now there's a little note there, plus static cleanup. Typically, if you're trying to make a very high-end dry sift product, the key coming out of your grinder isn't gonna fit the bill. Uh, you're gonna need to do some additional static cleanup to be able to get as much of the debris out as possible so that you can have better isolated trichome heads. Now bubble hash, this is the extraction method that we'll spend a little bit more talking time talking about today, excuse me, because of the versatility that I was mentioning in the last slide. And it comes with a little bit more equipment to execute on properly. You have to wash it. You need a drain vessel that the ice water is being used to go in. Um, it's being filtered and then it's ultimately freeze dried. So whereas dry sift is a dry process with dry cured material, either trim or flour or popcorn, bubble hash or ice water hash, is done with ice and water, uh, which the cold temperatures and the water and agitation help detach those trichome heads, which are then filtered, graded, and dried. And then at the end of all of this, unless you're selling just a straight bubble hash product, of which there's a couple varieties, or a dry sift or a teeth product, which again, there's different grades and varieties, uh, it's all pressed on a rosin press. So all of the textures that we were just talking about in the last slide, that large kaleidoscope of different products that can come out of solventless, those are all made on one piece of equipment, and that is a rosin press. So before we get into some data and start talking about some SKUs, I wanted to go over a couple of solventless facts and myths. Uh, these are some important points that we get asked about constantly, and I'm sure people in the audience right now uh, are already thinking about this or were potentially already planning to ask these questions. So is solvent list less potent than BHO or perhaps other concentrates? And the testing answer is no, it's not. Depending on the product coming out the other end with rosin, you can get potency ranges anywhere from 60 to 99%. And on that super high end, that's a THCA isolate. So you can actually isolate THCA with mechanical separation, a little bit of a long word there, uh, chain of words, but the potency is absolutely comparable depending on what the starting material is. Second thing, 
does CBD play nice with solventless? Uh, short answer is sometimes. We're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about this, but for all the people in the audience who are either hemp farmers or are using hemp and are interested in how solventless will work with your CBD product, it absolutely can. It really comes down to the starting quality of your CBD. So if you've got field hemp, to be perfectly honest with everyone here, that tends to not work so well with solventless processes. If you've got boutique, high-end grown CBD, it tends to work a lot better. Does solventless offer comparable yield? This is another one of the biggest myths that we're constantly combating. You know, with high quality material, and we'll talk in depth about this, you're gonna find that yields are extremely comparable or right up just on top of po other popular processing methods such as hydrocarbon, uh, CO2, ethanol, things like that. Now, yield is a little bit of a tricky question because it depends so much on what your starting material is, what you're trying to get out the other end, and really what you're trying to accomplish. And that where we've learned a lot over the last couple of years uh, in the solventless space is that with a solventless product, you need to think about it by making your high end, if that's what you're shooting for, and then multiple washes or multiple presses to get all of the remaining oil out so that you can have what is more considered a full yield so that you're getting, you know, using all parts of the buffalo, as it were. And then lastly, is solventless expensive to produce? So very short answer is no, it's not. Solventless tends to be significantly less expensive in terms of equipment, uh, regulatory needs, than hydrocarbon, CO2, and other extraction methods. Not only is the equipment quite a bit cheaper, objectively, you're also going to find that you don't need a C1D1 room in your state if that's required for hydrocarbon. Regulators tend to look a lot more favorably on solvent lists and are more likely to grant it in your lab because the safety aspect of it is not in question due to high pressure flammable solvents. So it tends to be, if not the least expensive extraction method to get started with. Cool. So now none of this would be complete without going through some important market data. So first we're gonna start with a bunch of data that we've pulled from the MJ Biz 2019 fact book. Uh, I plug MJ Biz's fact book every seminar that I ever do. Uh, we are not affiliated with MJ Biz in any way, but they have some of the best data in the entire industry. Now there's gonna be slides throughout this presentation that reference data from headset and other places, but for everyone who's tuned in the webinar now, if you are interested in really, really getting into the nitty gritty with market data, product data, um, every kind of cannabis data that you could imagine, the MJ Biz Factbook is probably the best place to find it. So again, we receive zero financial incentives to plug them. We just really like their data. And for everyone who's here trying to learn things, highly suggest checking them out. It's a, it's a great source to learn. So. Most of this data, I believe, was pulled before everything happened with COVID-19. But with that being said, we're still seeing many of these signs happening now and that it seems that people are extremely optimistic in the processing market. And we're hearing that from many of our other industry partners as well. So cannabis processors in the next 12 months, their outlook is saying 92% are expecting a better outlook. That's a lot, that is a major majority. And if you even include the 4% that's the same, you're looking at a vast majority of cannabis processors expecting to encounter better conditions uh, in the next 12 months. Now, that's a little bit open-ended. They didn't explain exactly what better means necessarily, but that means that a lot of cannabis processors who are already in the space and doing this are optimistic about what's going to happen over the next year. Now, processors that are planning to expand into new markets over the next 12 months, 81% of them are. So that is a pretty telling number that another key figure here is that the vast majority of cannabis processors are planning to expand their operations. Uh, I, I struggle to think of any other industry where this kind of thing is happening. Uh, processors are expanding they are feeling that things are looking good. 
And then this last data point here on this slide, uh, it, it stands out a little bit because it doesn't seem to fit in with the others, but wholesale cultivators are indicating that high quality is 40, excuse me, 46% of wholesale cultivators are going for high quality as the key differentiating factor for the products that they're selling. Now, that's extremely important because high quality material is one of the key aspects to ensuring that you can create some of the high-end solventless products that we spoke about earlier. Um, so it means that access to high quality material is likely increasing for businesses either entering the space or for businesses that are not fully vertically integrated and have to source material uh, from wholesale cultivators. So organic at 23% is also great because organic material tends to be very, very good with solventless. And then you see below that, low cost, grown sustainably, terpene content, value, and other, those are pretty minor. You know, high quality material and organic material seems to be what more wholesale cultivators are focusing on, meaning that processors are gonna have access to more material and better material, hopefully. Now, the next slide, and this is the number two executive summary takeaway in the MJ Biz 2019 Factbook. This is a little bit to take in. So a lot of numbers, a lot of words. I'm going to try and walk everyone through this so that you can really take this nugget of wisdom away. So gray, unprofitable, blue, break even, green, profitable. Pretty easy to understand that. Now, this graph is telling us that the number of SKUs produced has a dramatic effect on reported profitability from the businesses that participated and answered the survey that MJ Biz put out to gather this data. So that red box at the bottom, what you're gonna see is a massive increase in reported profitability for businesses that are having 11 to 15 different SKUs compared to one to three. So if you're a processor and you're only making a handful of different products, reported profitability is absolutely tiny. Whereas businesses that are producing multiple SKUs, and again, it seems at this time, like the perfect range is around 11 to 15, 83% of them are reporting profitability. Again, it, it's hard to overstate how dramatic of a difference that actually is. And even you're seeing businesses that produce seven to 10 different unique products are reporting three, three times as many of those businesses are reporting profitable or profitability over businesses that are doing four to six. And then at 16 plus, you start seeing a little bit of a drop off, although it's still a strong increase over the businesses that are only producing a handful. And then at the top of this graph, it's really showing that processors that offer products across multiple categories, meaning hydrocarbon, solventless, ethanol, different areas of extraction, almost half of them report profitability. So when you combine offering multiple products in different categories with different types of SKUs, that's really where you hit the sweet spot of being able to come up with a balanced product line that addresses as many consumers' needs in a dispensary as possible. There's always gonna be consumers that are looking for the cheapest gram of flour they can buy. Just like there's always concentrate customers that are only going to be looking for the highest end solvent list that's on the shelf. It's important for any business to produce multiple SKUs and to have SKUs across different categories. So tying all of these thoughts together with the data that we just reviewed, adding solventless concentrates is one of, if not the least expensive ways to add additional SKUs to your product lineup and is one and a set of SKUs that are highly sought after by connoisseurs and influencers. So make sure that you are offering enough SKUs to really help give you the best shot at increasing your profitability and becoming profitable uh, and hitting that break even point if you have not already. Cool, so now I'm gonna spend some time shifting gears pretty completely going away from market data and giving some more explanations about what kinds of popular solventless SKUs are out there. So there's a lot of text on this slide and on the next one. I'm not gonna read every single one word for word. Uh, I would highly encourage anyone to go back to the recording and dig through this a little bit more if there's some parts of these SKUs 
that you're interested in learning a bit more about or simply asking a question here in the webinar and I'll answer those at the end. The number one SKU that we're seeing sold in the market right now is ice hash water rosin. Uh, this has a very high price per gram. It's the top sold rosin product and it's a connoisseur grade concentrate that builds brands and loyal buyers. Okay, I, I read off the first one. I'm not gonna do that for all of them. The big thing about having solventless products of virtually any variety is that they can win over influencers and brand builders that are going to talk about your product a lot more than some of the more entry level, less expensive products. And we've got clients who where perhaps the vast majority of the revenue they generate is off of some of the more entry or budget friendly concentrates or products, but that they really have built their brand on the backs of their ice water hash rosin, their bubble hash rosin. Um, and directly to that, hash rosin vape cartridges becoming extremely popular now, takes quite a bit of an R&D, but these are the most expensive, the most sought after, and at this current time, a fairly rare product. Uh, we're seeing those go from anywhere from 50 to $80 a half gram, and it really is the ultimate cannabis product for multiple consumers. Talking about sift, there's of course dry sift rosin, tends to retail for less than ice water hash rosin, but it has a lot of versatility with a lot of different grades and quality. Now, solventless edibles are another area that's really seeing tremendous growth right now and another opportunity that multiple businesses should be thinking about if they're not already. The number three edible in California, according to headsets state-by-state -state sales database data, is a solventless edible. In the past, it was the number one edible, uh, and that's a Kiva product. So these edibles tend to retail for 20% more than standard edibles or more, depending on the market. And you can use a lower grade starting material to get a food grade oil to make it work. Additionally, there's a couple more SKUs that we're gonna talk about here. Uh, solventless topicals and balms, the number one through five topicals or balms in California are made solventlessly and they're all Papa and Barclays products. They're 50 milliliter, tincture that goes for about $66, I believe. Uh, their products range from you know, $15 on up, but they do command a premium and they are a true full spectrum quality product made with, again, solventless food grade oil that's put into premium topicals. Now, you've also got full melt ice water hash, which is something that a lot of people who've been around the industry for a while will be familiar with. And this is the ultimate product for connoisseurs. This is pure isolated trichome heads that melt without leaving any residue. Now the actual sales volume for full melt ice water hash isn't terribly high, but if you have high enough quality material to create it, this is what wins over connoisseurs like no other. On the bottom left, we've got flower rosin. This is an entry level rosin product, uh, more popular in certain markets and others, typically less mature or less developed markets because it's such an easy way to get started. You can literally just take a dried cured flour, put it in a rosin press, squish it out, and you've got flour rosin. It does tend to retail for less than hash and sift rosin, however. And then finally, we've got hash infused pre-rolls. Uh, this is the number five pre-roll in Colorado. It's been as high as number one in the past. I updated all of these numbers this morning just to make sure that I was providing accurate data for everyone. But they also command a pretty hefty premium on how much they sell for. Typically, these are pre-rolls that are infused with bubble hash, uh, sometimes with SIFT or Keef 2. Um, but as you everyone can see, there is a lot of variety here in terms of what kinds of different SKUs that someone can make in order to be successful with solventless. So through these, this is kind of scratching the surface because underneath topicals and balms and edibles especially, there are so many different varieties from tinctures, balms, gummies, brownies, I mean, you name it. If there's a product that you're particularly interested in, that you love, that your market loves, be made with solventless that product can command a premium and that you can do it without having to throw down hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment purchasing okay now we're going to move on to some of the most important parts of this presentation and why i think a lot of people are tuning in in the first place which is to really understand 
how they can be successful with solventless and what they need to be looking for in the first place to do this. So one thing before we jump into genetic selection that I just wanted to show everyone real fast as an end note on the versatility of rosin is that these eight products were all made from a single bubble hash strain. Uh, one of our consultants that we work with, Simpson Solventless on Instagram, uh, whoever is on Instagram, I'd highly encourage you to follow him. He does some of the best work in the industry. He took one strain of bubble hash and set out to figure out how many different SKUs, how many different products can I just make with bubble hash that are dabable concentrates. This says nothing about cartridges or edibles or topicals. But you can see just alone, this is eight different textures that are being produced from one single strain of bubble hash, uh, all at very different you know levels of interest depending on the consumer so just really driving home the point that there's a lot more versatility with solvent lists than a lot of people realize so now how do i take solvent lists and make it successful for my business and the most important thing to start with when you're going down this road and really trying to figure this out is how to understand trichome structure you can't just put any strain in with solventless and have it be successful. And the reason for that is because of the trichomes and the resin content. Because we're not dissolving the resin out of the plant material with the solvent and we're detaching it mechanically, the actual size and shape of the trichome that the plant produces are absolutely critical to getting a yield that's going to be profitable for your business and for making a product that consumers are going to be excited about uh, when it's sitting on the shelf. So in this slide, and there's going to be two slides talking about trichomes here, we see A, B, C. Those are all mid-range or below. So A, C, E, and F, these are tiny. You can see that that's you know 20 microns, 50 microns, 20 microns, 10, 10. These are very, very, very small trichomes trichomes and when you're doing an ice water hash filter process or a sift process typically the microns below 45 tend to be food grade and they're still very useful but they don't get captured nearly as well as the example d which is the capitate stock trichome that has a large glandular head full of resin a fairly large stock this is a very resinous trichome it's a large size. It's pretty much the ideal shape and type to process solventlessly, whether you're making bubble hash, flour rosin, sick rosin, whatever it is. So the cheapest way that you can figure this out without spending a ton of money on a microscope or another product is just to get a jeweler's loop. It's not going to have a micron rating on it, but it will give you a much better idea of what type of trichomes you're dealing with. I mean, you could literally buy a cheap one for 10 or $15 on eBay. So really getting into your plant or your plants or the strain that you want to put through your solventless process and looking at it at the nearly microscopic level, that is what's going to help you first determine if that strain is going to be viable for solventless or not. Additionally, and I just came across this earlier this week, and I've got to give credit where it's absolutely due, which is to Farmhouse Studio Genetics. They're based in the Northwest. And this strain, sugar coat, which is pictured here, was bred specifically for solventless. Now, something that you're going to start hearing a lot more about is trichome detachability. Because again, saying this over and over, we're talking about mechanical separation. How well do your trichomes neatly detach from the plant material so that they can be captured, isolated, and then processed? So the perfect hash trichome has a thin neck a medium length stock and a large glandular head. Now, I think farmhouse coined this term because I haven't heard it anywhere else before this is the weak neck trichome, which provides optimal detachment. So if you see where the arrow is pointing, look at how thin and narrow that little bridge is between the stock and the head. That means with even very, very gentle agitation, that should detach easily and be able to be captured. So there's a lot of genetic companies out there that are now breeding strains specifically for solventless, which is often to see, making it that much more viable and that much more profitable. 
at the same time, again, it really comes down to understanding what your plants can do before you commit to large runs. Whereas with a solvent-based extraction method, you kind of just throw it in and run it and go from there. With solventless, you need to pay a lot more attention, not only to the quality of your material, but the types of trichomes that your material is actually making. So you're probably asking, okay, this all looks good. These trichome examples are really cool, but what kinds of strains are we talking about here? So I've got good news for you. If you want to screenshot this, please go ahead. Again, this will be available in the recap that will be sent to everyone. But I've come up with a nice healthy list of different strains that people can take advantage of in their own grows and start you know, hunting for. Now, what's important to also understand is just because you go pick up a chem dog off of one of many seed websites or from a friend, that does not guarantee that that strain of chem dog is gonna have that trichome structure or the resin content by raw potency that's gonna be a winner with solventless. These are strains, however, that we see our clients running constantly, that we see mentioned on Instagram constantly, and are a great place to start for anyone that's either struggling a little bit to get some strains that are really producing well for solventless, or if they're before they're even getting started and you're vertically integrated, going to grow your own material, these are ones that you can actually look into getting seeds, getting cuts, talking to people, um, and starting with these. You're, you're gonna see many of the best hash makers across the world are washing, drying, and pressing many of these strains, crosses of these strains. Uh, these are some of the most popular lineages in the entire cannabis space for solventless processing. Now, with that being said, things are changing all the time. There's always new genetics that are coming out. And for those of you who are tuning in who are not vertically integrated, meaning you're not cultivating your own product, you don't have quite as much control over the supply chain of the cannabis that you happen to be processing, it's really important to ask the wholesaler that you're buying your cannabis from that you intend to process, has this material been washed? Do you have other customers who have washed this material? Is this going to be a strain that's gonna play nice with solventless? We never advise customers or people who are looking to get into solventless to blindly go out, buy tens of pounds of fresh frozen hundreds and start washing it and hope for the best. You really need to talk to whoever you're buying your cannabis from or whoever your grower is that's responsible for growing these strains, having a much better understanding of will this strain provide the right trichome structure and have the right resin content so that I can be profitable with my solventless processing methods. So really doing a little bit more digging, putting a bit more of the onus on the cultivator or the provider to help provide you with some strains and some material and some solutions that will be successful for solventless processing. So my favorite of all of this list right now is the Tropicana Cookies by Oni Seed Co. There are too many genetic companies to name that are excellent. Uh, but there's so many good profiles, and these are some of the top shelf strains just for flour in general that are now being refined into, you know, what are considered to be the best concentrates perhaps in the entire world. And that sugar coat strain that we were just showing with the weak neck trichome, uh, farmhouse genetic, farmhouse studio genetics, excuse me, told me that that strain and those seeds will be available pretty soon. So I would definitely make sure to follow them on Instagram and get an idea of when those are dropping because we expect that those will sell out very quickly, uh, but hard to go wrong with starting with any of these. Okay, so we're gonna get into the end here and really wrap this all up for everyone. Now, before we do the full wrap up, it's really important to understand what kind of space you're gonna be operating in. and for a lot of businesses, and the question that we get constantly is how much space do I need to do all this? This sounds great. I wanna make these products. This equipment sounds good. I've got good material, or I know someone who does. How do I get my space going? Less than a thousand square feet is very common for solventless operations or divisions. You would be surprised to see that some of the best concentrates in the solventless world and in the world in general are being made in what almost look like closets and very small areas. so that a lot of square footage is definitely not necessary unless you're trying to really scale up your operation and do very high volume. 
Now, the scalability of solventless is something that has changed a lot recently. Uh, there's a lot of innovation happening and that this can scale well above that. And you've got operations that are saying thousand square feet. You know, I've got 50,000 square feet to work with. How, how can you help me there? Short answer is you don't need a lot to get started. But as you scale, of course, you'll need a little bit more space to produce more and more. Um, proper floor space and ceiling height planning is also important. You know, getting started with this, and this is something that we offer as a service as well, is helping with floor plans, but that really understanding how all of the pieces of equipment that you need to produce the products that you're trying to bring to market, how do they fit into your lab? How many of them do you need? Where do they go? These are all very critical things to think about before you put pen to paper. And because most regulators demand this information before you're even allowed to open up shop or make any changes anyway. Um, and then again, wrapping that up, developing a predetermined processing space flow will save you time and money. And it can always be modified as you grow, as you change, as you make different products, you're not set in stone on these things. But just making the point that having some adequate planning ahead of time will really save a lot of headache and increase your profitability in the long run. Now, take everything that we just talked about. Here are the top four ways that your business can succeed with Solventless. And the number one way is know your market and what it wants. You know, people on the West Coast in California, Colorado, very mature market, their appetite for 60 to $80 or more grams of hash rosin is a lot higher than it is on the East Coast, at least in the licit markets. Now, what you're gonna find is that every market in its stage of maturity or development is gonna grow from extreme interest in just raw flour to more concentrates, more products, more flavor profiles. So it's really important to understand, you know, what are dispensaries that you're trying to work with or are already working with? What are they saying? What are they selling? So before you go all in on trying to get the holy grail of making a rosin cartridge, there's some steps along the way that you need to make and you wanna make sure that your market is ready for that product and that you're gonna be successful with it. The second is to source or cultivate premium quality material for dabbable products only. That's the key here is that if you're trying to make a dabbable concentrate, the quality of your material is tantamount to success or failure uh, out the other end for what you're trying to do. Make sure to test that material before you commit to a full batch processing. You know, just like we we're talking about jeweler's loop, look at the trichomes, really understand what you're doing. Now, if you're making a topical or an edible, I'm not saying that you can use lower quality material. You, you can, you don't have to, but that more of a food grade oil, a trim, uh, anything along those lines can absolutely fit the bill for edibles, assuming that, of course, it passes contamination testing uh, because the solventless process does not offer any sort of remediation the same way that butane does, for example. So premium quality material for dabbable products is absolutely critical. Uh, additionally, environmental controls really are the difference maker for true top shelf solventless concentrates. You know, having a cold room when you're making bubble hash, uh, ensuring that your room is clean, that you have a good process down. These are all things that we've got numerous videos and blogs about that you can dig into the details on, but environmental control is extremely important to really make those ultra high end concentrates. And then my last big piece of advice for everyone who's taken the time with me so far to get all, all the way here is be mindful of creating multiple products with your source material. Don't just make a bubble hash and then sell a full spectrum bubble hash. Make and, full, sell, make and sell a full spectrum bubble hash and a food grade, you know, topical or edible or take the extra leftovers and put it in a pre-roll. There's so many different options to get your full yield and to make more money from your solventless products than just coming out with one thing or two things. You've got a lot more options at your fingertips. So check in, see what people in your market are interested in, what they're buying, and then work from there. So that wraps up the presentation. I really appreciate everyone coming. Uh, pretty much right on the dot, 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, Eric, if you wanna start shooting some questions my way, I'd be happy to start answering. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Eric. That was really fantastic and um, very nicely detailed. Uh, we do have another, a number of questions that have come in, and I'll just remind everyone again, you'll see a, uh, 
questions box on your screen, so please do type in your questions. We've got about 15 minutes here. Um, Eric, we've got a number of questions about about yield and trichome detachability. I'm going to try to sort of bake them into one question. Um, how okay. are um, <laughs> how are uh, there will probably be a couple questions here, really? But how do you measure yield, and how do you, uh, in terms of sourcing genetics, um, how do you know what you're getting before taking out the jeweler's loop and, and looking closely? I guess um, uh, what should what should uh, folks be looking for when trying to measure trichomes and trying to plan for yield? Yeah, great question. What it comes down to is this selection process that experienced processors have really refined over time. You know, coming into it as a newcomer where you don't have that ability, it's almost this sixth sense where you can look at a bud or a fresh frozen plant or a plant even before it's been cut down and say, wow, this is a very resinous strain. It smells really good. The bud structure is not super dense or super larfy, you know, very light. So, you know, for everyone who's tuned in that doesn't have the sixth sense of the master processor, it's really important to know, you know, has this strain been grown before by this cultivator and what's it testing at? If you've got more juice to squeeze, you're going to have a better shot at having a solventless product, you know, whereas if it's a very low potency strain, there's just not as much resin there to expel, to extract. So that's the first component of it too. And then having an honest conversation with your grower, with the cultivator, whoever is involved and just asking them questions, you know, do you have any experience, excuse me, with doing this solventlessly, either with your own business, if they're legally allowed to process, or do they, have they talked to anyone else who's familiar with the strain that's processed it solventlessly? It's really, a combination of, you know, using your spidey sense to say, is this plant got enough resin to work with? And does the person who's producing it have details about whether or not it's been processed solventlessly before, or do they think that it will process well solventlessly? And then I'm sure you've got a lot of questions about yield. So should I just go directly into that, or do you have one specifically that I should answer? Um, yeah, uh, one one question, and maybe just to frame the conversation about yield here, is um, how can folks know that the yield they're deriving from this extraction process is the greatest potential yield? Meaning, um, how can they know they're not missing or, or missing out on the trichome detachability we're talking about? Yep, another or another really important question, and it's it's really hard to drill down and say that strain X. I will get and reclaim 98% of the available trichome mass because of the bud structure versus strain Z, which I can only expect to get 95% total reclamation or something like that. But what it really comes down to is taking an experimentation process. So if you're washing bubble hash, you will wash two or three times until all you're getting anymore is basically just plant material and debris. And then you said, okay, my trichomes are spent. Or if you're pressing hash or flour rosin or sift rosin, you know, pressing those first couple bags multiple times to understand like where does where does the road end with this material? When can I not get any more out of it? And then backing into your math about what are your yields, what was your cost to produce it or acquire it, and then you know, getting into your spreadsheet and trying to figure out did this strain make money for me or before committing to processing a whole bunch of it, you know, moving on to a different one. We have a little story. We were talking with a client of ours and they washed a tangy strain that they grew, put it all out. Their cost per gram to produce that strain was about $135. That was just their production cost. And they said, Whoa, you know, I, I can't, you know, I'm not going to make any money on this. So they only did a small test batch, figured out the yield wasn't too good. And now they just sell that strain either through hydrocarbon processing or it's just whole flour is very successful. Whereas for some of their other hash strains, uh, I think it might've been Tropicana cookies, the lane that I was talking about, you know, their cost per gram to produce that was closer to eight to $10 or a little bit more of hash rosin because it made so much hash. It had such a good yield that their production cost went way, way down. And that's one of the winners that they, wash and produce and sell constantly. So 
you know, you have to take a little bit of a holistic approach, uh, but really trying to get as much out of whatever you're doing as possible and then working into the numbers to see if it makes sense. Yeah, we have a, a couple questions here about um, just the different factors that go into these products. And, and obviously, we've talked a lot about source product and the, the genetics that are going into solventless products. Um, but what other factors can can folks influence, whether that's temperature or pressure? Um, what other factors might go into this process? And uh, what are some, some quick tips to really improve those? Yeah. So... All along the solventless processing chain, you're going to have all kinds of variables, assuming, you know, if you're either growing the material yourself, starting there, you know, how is the material being grown? Is it indoor or outdoor? Um, there's almost too many variables to mention on the cultivation side of things. So I'm going to focus my answer on the extraction side, which is where I know significantly more about. And that's having high variable control is extremely important to be able to come out with a consistent product. So that's something that we at Pure Pressure really, really focus on is having the most precise and replicatable, you know, variable control with the equipment that we make and sell. So that being able to create a consistent product by controlling your time, your temperature, your pressure, how hot or cold the room that you're working in is, there's all these different data points that someone is gonna to want to understand so that they can compare one strain against another in the most scientific way possible in order to better understand, you know, is this a product that consumers want? Is it a product that we're producing consistently? And is the end result something that we feel that we can replicate consistently? So with the extraction process, it really comes down to time, pressure, temperature, uh, for rosin, and then with ice water hash, it's water temperature, environmental temperature, um, sift, a little bit less variable control, a little bit more post-processing cleanup. So because we don't have a ton of time left here, I would again encourage anyone who's interested in getting tips and tricks on pressing rosin, on making ice water hash, on making sift, uh, anything in between, our YouTube channel, Go Pure Pressure, our blog, which is on our website, gopurepressure.com. We've got in-depth articles on all of these topics, so I would highly encourage everyone to go check those out and, and do some reading and some watching. Excellent, yeah, a few folks were asking about additional resources, so that's great. Um, Eric, could you speak to the, um, the impact of, of freezing the material before, uh, say, a bubble hash process and, and whether that might yield better results? Yeah, absolutely, and this is, a webinar that I gave trying to reach a very broad audience. In the future, I will give a webinar that's more intermediate and advanced solventless. Uh, we didn't really touch on fresh frozen very much in this. Now, fresh frozen is when you take cannabis and you defan it, take all the fan leaves off, and then you immediately freeze it. Now, doing a fresh frozen product is what can create what's called a live product. So, I'm sure you've heard of live resin made with hydrocarbon or live rosin, which is the ice water hash process that's then taking a material that's never been dried or cured. So when you don't dry or cure your flour, you defan it and freeze it, that tends to give a flavor profile and a terpene profile, uh, as well as changes in the cannabinoids because it hasn't been dried or cured, that many consumers prefer over a dried and cured starting material for their concentrate. Now, there's a lot of debate about this, but for a business owner, having fresh frozen material as your starter for bubble hash specifically is one of the smartest moves you can make because not only are you creating a product that the majority of dabable concentrate consumers are looking for anyway, but also you don't need the infrastructure or the time to go ahead and dry and carefully cure your material, which as many growers and people who have grown who've tuned in understand is one of, if not the most difficult parts of the entire cultivation process. Drying and curing your flower perfectly is an art more than it is a science. Um, and that, that can be very difficult to do. So by having freezers and freezing your material to make a fresh frozen, you are skipping that headache entirely. You of course need freezers to store your material in, but that the cold temperatures also actually increase trichome detachability 
because they are more brittle. So for multiple reasons, both from a consumer standpoint, a business ROI standpoint, um, an equipment standpoint, a space standpoint, doing fresh frozen makes sense for most businesses. Excellent. Um, we have a question here. Um, uh, if without access to specific screens at the moment, um, could you talk about the idea of practicing or optimizing your process using lower quality strains that may have uh, less optimal trichome structure and um, whether that will uh, whether that practice will, will really help the grower or, or whether that might be leading them down uh, maybe an unhelpful. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good question. Um, typically when someone or a business or a group of people are trying to get familiar with the solventless process, um, using material that they don't necessarily expect to process and then ride all the way home to the bank is a great way to really get your chops under you because you've got a lot more margin for error and you can really get the techniques down a lot better if the stakes aren't quite so high. So I would say that, you know, lower quality starting material, mid, mid grade and below is actually a very important tool in the solventless processors arsenal because it can a teach the team, teach your extractors how to do all of this very well before your top shelf, top cola buds are on the line to be processed perfectly. And also a lot of the mid-grade and below material is the perfect material to use for food grade oil. Um, there's definitely businesses out there that use their top shelf for their food grade as well. But if you're not super confident that the material that you've got or that you're working with is going to make a light golden kind of blonde hash rosin, it's a great idea to just turn it into a food grade oil and then put that in a topical or an edible. Excellent. We've got um, a few uh, a few cost questions here, and I realize we're bumping up against the hour, but maybe we can end with this one. Um, in general terms, can you describe the difference in, say, overhead costs associated with starting with dried or cured product versus fresh frozen product, um, all the equipment that might go into that, uh, and uh, how a grower or how a um, uh, how a manufacturer might keep keep those costs in mind? Yeah, absolutely. So. It's a tough one to answer because every business has many businesses, very different objectives about what their weekly throughput should be, what kinds of SKUs and products they're trying to make out the other end. Um, what you're going to find is that with fresh frozen, you don't need as much space to do the drying and curing, and you don't need quite as much environmental control in that specific area of your lab because you're filling freezers full. But what that does mean is that you have to understand, you know, what is the electricity requirements for, you know, drying and curing your material versus running a bunch of freezers. You know, every business is different and electricity prices are different all over the country. Uh, some places are off the grid and they're full solar and it's not really much of an issue for them, but most businesses don't fall into that category. So overhead wise, it's hard for me and I'm, I'm hesitant to say that, well, if you do fresh frozen, it's going to be a lot cheaper for you, I promise. I, I know that I cannot make that promise because it depends on your area, but the vast majority of our customers, and we work with labs all across the world, many of the biggest solvents processors across North America who make literally the best concentrates in the entire world, the vast majority of them are doing fresh frozen and turning that into bubble hash and then making a variety of products as you know maybe their flagship solventless concentrate. So, I apologize for whoever was asking that, if that wasn't exactly the answer you're looking for, but please contact us. We would love to help you better understand what this equipment would look like in your operation. We take a very hands-on, each customer is different approach. Uh, we'd be happy to run you through an equipment list and show you what things look like. Um, that's no cost, no obligation. We'd be happy to talk you through your needs. Excellent, well, yes, I would uh, echo that and uh, recommend everyone jot down the contact information here uh, and I'll also remind everyone that, that a link to this presentation will be hitting your email inboxes um, very soon here uh, and Eric and everyone at Pure Pressure I want to thank you for the presentation today this has been really fantastic and really insightful okay hey thank you for having us I really appreciate it and great job moderating
Thank you so much. And uh, once again, everyone, for attending, uh, thank you and have a fantastic day.